Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. My name is uh, Tom Boyce. I'm a professor of pediatrics and interdisciplinary studies at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, uh, BC. Approximately uh, half of this audience tonight is here as part of the Distinctive Voices lecture series. Now in its sixth year, this series has brought topics of cutting edge science, medicine, and technology to a public audience here in Orange County community and has reached a wider virtual audience by making these lectures available on the Distinctive Voices YouTube channel. The rest of you uh, who are here are participants in the Arthur M. Sackler Colloquium on biological embedding of early social adversity from fruit flies to kindergartners. <laughs> it's a very serious <laughs> topic. The, the Sackler Colloquia um, are a series of scientific meetings of the National Academy of Sciences scheduled three times each year, which aims to increase communication among researchers across a number of scientific fields. Modeled after the discussion meetings of the Royal Society of London, they address a scientific topic of broad interest cutting across two or more of the traditional disciplines and providing a unique opportunity for leading researchers in a rapidly developing field to meet and interact. They are supported by a generous gift from Gillian Sackler in memory of her late husband, Arthur M. Sackler. This particular meeting is being co-sponsored by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, a Canadian organization that has played a formative role in many of the professional careers represented here in this auditorium uh, tonight. The Experience-Based Brain and Biological Development Research Program, which launched in 2003, explores the core questions of how social experiences affect human biology and how the trajectory of development and health is set very early in life, persisting throughout the life course. I can imagine uh, no better or more appropriate speaker to open a conference of such broad disciplinary scope than Professor Jared Diamond. In his scholarly work, ranging from evolutionary biology to the ancient history of human societies, Dr. Diamond's writings brilliantly illustrate the insights that can derive from transgressing staid and obstructive disciplinary boundaries. Here to introduce our speaker tonight is Diane Griffin. Diane is, a, uh, is the Alfred and Jill Sommer Professor and Chair in Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Griffin is a member of the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences, where she currently serves on the Council's the Council Executive Committee and the Editorial Board for the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Diane. Well, welcome to uh, Distinctive Voices at the Beckman Center. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Jared Diamond, Professor of Physiology and Geography at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author and a uh, eclectic explorer of topics ranging from the birds of New Guinea to salt absorption of the gallbladder. His diverse work has earned him a description as a polymath and a Renaissance man. Dr. Diamond is primarily known for his research on the evolution of human societies from a biological and geographic point of view. He earned his PhD in physiology from Cambridge, Cambridge University and since 1997 has been a part of the UCLA Department of Geography where he focuses on biogeography and human society. His landmark work, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, a book dealing with the rise and fall of societies, became a bestseller and received numerous awards including the Pulitzer Prize and Aventus Prize for Science Books and the Phi Beta Kappa Award in Science. A television documentary based on this book was produced by the National Geographic Society in 2005. He speaks 12 languages, is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Institute of Medicine, a member of the American Phys Philosophical Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Diamond's many awards and honors include the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the International Cosmos Prize, and the National Medal of Science. He's a U.S. Regional Director of the World Wildlife Fund and serves on the editorial board of Skeptic Magazine. 
Please join me welcome the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Jared Diamond. Let me first check whether you can hear me okay in back. Can you hear too much of me in back? <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you um, this evening to discuss a subject dear to my heart, namely children and the raising of children. This is a subject of which I have recent experience. My wife's and my twin sons are now 24 years old. They graduated college a couple of years ago which means that, naively, one might say, our child-rearing years are over. But any of you who have children and grandchildren <laughs> know that for the human species, unlike the case for tigers and various birds, um, child-rearing is never over. <laughs> I'd like to begin by telling you a story of child-rearing in New Guinea. One of the first New Guineans that I met was a um, young man called Inu, whose childhood had been interesting. He grew up in a society that was, to us, strikingly repressive. Um, children were saddled with senses of obligations, made to feel guilty. Fifty years ago, I was told, although I can't confirm it myself, that child suicide was not unknown because of the extremely repressive child rearing in this society. And by the age of five, Inu became dissatisfied and crossed the river to the other side where there was another tribe among which he had relatives, so he got himself adopted there. And he found, having moved to this other tribe, that he'd gone from a very repressive society to a very laissez-faire society. In his new adoptive society, the attitude was the children ought to be allowed to make their own decisions, and that meant that if a baby was playing near a fire, it was the baby's decision whether or not to get burnt. And the result was that most people as adults in this society had burns on their skins from playing near fires. While both of those extremes are very lacy fair and very lacy very repressive upbringings can be found among individuals in our society. Uh, I'm not aware of any modern industrial society that is as repressive or as laissez-faire as the two societies that Inu experienced. Uh, but the laissez-faire extreme turns out to be common, practically the rule among hunter-gatherers and the repressive extreme is found among many herding societies. Cultural anthropologists, until recently, didn't pay much attention to children. There are so-called so -called cross-cultural studies of child-rearing, but for the most part, the, until recently, those were not comparisons of American children with hunter-gatherer children, but they instead compared children in different state-level societies. They would compare American, German, Japanese, Israeli, and Chinese children. But all of those state societies have convergently sim similar child-rearing practices, such as formal education by the state, protection of children by state authorities and police, and not just by parents, same-age playgroups, children sleeping in a separate room from their parents, and an infant nursing schedule set by the mother rather than by the infant. Hence, generalizations about childhood by authorities like Piaget, Freud, pediatricians, and child psychologists. The generalizations based on so-called cross-cultural studies have actually been based on a tiny slice of the totality of human cultural diversity. They've been based on what anthropologists now call so-called weird, W-E-I-R-D, societies, where weird stands for Western, educated, industrial, rich, democratic societies. <laughs> for example, Freud st stressed and generalized about the importance of the sex drive and its frequent prostration. And maybe that's true for weird societies. But it certainly is not true for, for example, the Siriono Indians of Bolivia, for whom willing sex partners are constantly available. The sex drive is rarely, if ever, frustrated. And instead, the Siriono are preoccupied by hunger, the drive for food, and the frustration of the drive for food. Child rearing 
of, by thousands of traditional societies, constitutes thousands of traditional experiments in child rearing that we would never carry out ourselves in weird societies today, nor would we tolerate them in societies with state government. When we learn about the result of those natural experiments of bringing up children among hunter-gatherers and small-scale farming societies, some of the results of those experiments are ones to which we would say, good riddance, never again, such as the frequency of infanticide in small-scale traditional societies. But as I hope you'll see now, other features of those natural experiments are ones which we may admire and envy once we hear of them and that we may want to adopt for our own children. In recent decades, there have finally been half a dozen dedicated studies of child rearing among hunter-gatherers and more studies among small-scale farming societies. Just to give you a smorgasbord sample of what comes out of these studies of child rearing in traditional societies this evening, um, I'll talk about six phenomena. I'll talk about nursing, alloparenting, responsive caregivers to a child crying, physical punishment, freedom of a child to explore and play. Let's begin with nursing. Hunter-gatherer mothers nurse their children until, their infants until age three or four because, first of all, the mothers say they enjoy nursing their children and want to carry it on. And in addition, they lack domestic animal milk and they lack soft cereal gruels and they lack jaws of Gerber's applesauce and pulverized pumpkin onto which to wean their children. It's impossible for hunter-gatherers, it's impossible for anyone to wean a child until the child can nourish itself fully by chewing enough firm food unless it's provided with soft food as is the case with us today. And so it's only when a hunter-gatherer child is three or four years old that his teeth are capable of dealing with enough firm food to nourish the kid and the kid can then wean. Nursing in hunter-gatherer societies and small-scale traditional societies is what's called on-demand. That's to say the infant nurses when it wishes. The infant has frequent or essentially constant access to the breast either of its mother or the breast of another lactating woman. And that's even through the night because the mother and infant sleep together and the infant nurses even, whether the, even when the mother is asleep the mother may wake up twice during the night to nurse intentionally, but otherwise the infant next to the mother can nurse while the mother continues to lie there asleep. As a result, hunter-gatherer nursing frequencies are typically around four times an hour, and they consist of short bouts, about two minutes of nursing per bout, in contrast to the many fewer bouts and much longer bouts of nursing by Western mothers. A result of these frequent nursing bouts is what's called lactational amenorrhea. That's to say associated with lactation in hunter-gatherers and traditional societies is a shutdown of ovulation so that the nursing mother um, doesn't become pregnant again until or close to the time that the um, previous child is weaned and long birth spacing. And that's because of the release of hormones associated with frequent nursing that cause amenorrhea, shutdown. But an important thing that many educated women in Western societies don't learn, uh, educated Western women often do hear that lactation causes amenorrhea and shuts down ovulation so you can't get pregnant again. What they don't learn usually, is that that's the case only for frequent nursing bouts. And Western-style nursing, that's to say nursing three times a day, does not result in lactational amenorrhea. And so a, a good friend of mine um, is simply the latest in a long line of educated women who, to her dismay, found that she got pregnant again two months after giving birth, and she said what so many women said, but I thought that while I was nursing, that produces lactational amenorrhea, and that I couldn't become pregnant again. And yes, that's true if you're nursing four times an hour, but it's not true if you're nursing three times a day. 
a hunter-gatherer infant is in almost constant skin-to-skin -skin contact with its mother or with someone else. When a hunter-gatherer mother carries her infant, in virtually all hunter-gatherer societies that have been studied, infants are carried in a characteristic way. Namely, the in infant is carried vertically and is carried in various devices, pouches, slings, which have the result that the infant is facing forwards and the infant sees has the same field of view that the mother has. In contrast, in modern American and Western societies, infants are often carried or transported horizontally, lying down in a baby carriage, or if they're transported vertically, they're often facing backwards, they're held in a chest pouch or in a snuggly, so that the infant, whether horizontal or vertical facing backwards, the infant does not have the same field of view as the adult transporting the infant. It's speculated that this somehow contributes to the faster neuromotor development that's been reported for Kung hunter-gatherer infants than for Western infants. Among hunter-gatherers and small-scale farming societies, mother and infant in every single hunter-gatherer society that's been studied, and often the father as well, co-sleep. That's to say they sleep nearby, and usually they sleep on the same mat. Hunter-gatherer infants and, and their parents, therefore, do not go through the horrible experience of putting infants to bed that my wife and I went through, we were brainwashed when we brought home uh, the first of our twins from the hospital. We were so delighted to have him home that we, we put him in bed between us and we listened to his breathing. We were inexperienced parents, so we weren't sure if his, it was inexperienced, it was our first child. So we didn't know what an infant's breathing should sound like and we called the hospital and we said, is he breathing okay? And the hospital said, where is he? And we said, well, he's in bed with us. And they said, well, that will cause your baby to overheat, for God's sake, get him out of the bed and put him into a crib, despite the fact that for hundreds of thousands of years, infants have been sleeping next to their parents without any dire signs of overheating. So yes, we put our infant into a crib. And then we went through the agony that many of you will have gone through. Eventually, we were told, no, you should not have your infant in a crib in the same bedroom as you, for heaven's sakes put them in a separate bedroom, and we had twins to be put in separate bedrooms. It was absolutely horrible. We would, we would put our kids in their cribs, and we would sing to them and tell silly songs and bounce them up and down. And then when, then when we thought they were finally getting quiet and going to sleep, we would tiptoe out of the room, and they would start howling, and it was, it, it, they, it was just piteous, and we felt terrible, and we would come back in and hold them again. We felt absolutely awful, and they felt awful. Evidently, they felt awful. Uh, but that does not happen with hunter-gatherers, because every hunter-gatherer in human history for 100,000 years, every hunter-gatherer infant has, has co-slept with the parents without these disastrous consequences of overheating and various other things. The next phenomenon that I want to discuss is what's called alloparenting. That's to say having, in effect, multiple parents or caretakers. We, of course, have some alloparenting. Um, our kids um, are dealt with not just by their parents, but there may be a babysitter, or there may be an au pair, or the, there may be daycare. But nevertheless, the alloparenting, the alternative adult models that our infants have is very small compared to hunter-gatherer societies where there's far more alloparenting. For example, anthropologists among the pygmies measured the frequency with which a pygmy infant is passed between one caregiver to another. And over the course of several hours, the pygmy infant was passed back and forth between eight and 14 caregivers who were alloparents. The care of infants among hunter-gatherers then is not just by parents, but it's by grandparents, it's by older siblings, it's by other older children and other adults. A friend of mine, a fellow who was born to missionary, uh, missionary um, parents in Kenya, and as a teenager came back to the United States. Um, the biggest shock for him in, 
moving from Kenya, from a small village in Kenya to the United States, was the lack of allo parenting. He said that in his Kenya village, children ran back and forth between huts in the village, and the huts didn't have doors, the huts were all open, and each kid would have dinner at whatever hut they happened to be next to in the late afternoon, and every adult in the village, this young fellow came to know as his aunt or uncle. And so when he came back to the United States, with all of these allo parents, all of these adults who functioned as substitute parents, he was struck and shocked by the fact that, as he put it to me, American kids go into their houses and they close the door and they sit inside watching television, in contrast to his experience in Kenya. So that's allo parenting, which is a big part of child rearing among traditional societies. Now let's talk about the response to crying. What do you do if your baby cries? What do you do if your child cries? In the West, there's debate about what you should do. There's debate about whether it's good or bad to pick up or attend to an infant or child every time that it cries, or should you let it cry and make sure that nothing is seriously wrong and then go away and leave it for 10 minutes and come back? Um, when I was living in Germany 50 years ago, the belief then was that um, you should not coddle infants by responding too quickly to their crying. If an infant started crying, you made sure that nothing was wrong, but then you would go away and leave the infant for 10 minutes and hope that in 10 minutes the infant would, would quiet down. German virtues that 50 years ago German parents wanted to inculcate into their children included two German words were Selbstständigkeit and Ordnungsliebe. Selbstständigkeit means literally standing by yourself. So children needed to be encouraged to be independent, to take care of themselves, and not to be coddled by rushing to them and every time they cried. And Ordnungsliebe meant a love of order, order meaning a regular regular dependable practices, namely that if you start crying, you'd be left there for at least 10 minutes. What German parents 50 years ago wanted to avoid at all costs was for your child to be verwöhnt. Verwöhnt means spoiled, which in Germany in those days was very, very bad. And American children were regarded as verwöhnt, spoiled. <laughs> and so the theory was if your child cries and nothing obvious is wrong with it, leave it for 10 minutes and then check, and if it's still crying, leave it for half an hour. Co a common view then is that responding quickly to a crying child spoils a child, and you shouldn't do it, especially when putting a child to sleep at night. Among hunter-gatherers, though, the practice is to respond to an infant's crying within an average of 10 seconds. Somebody responds to an infant within 10 seconds of the infant starting crying. Now, one might then wonder, does this mean that hunter-gatherer infants spend lots more time crying than do Western, than do weird infants because they get reinforced and they learn that all they have to do is cry and some adult will rush to them? Well, there are measurements showing that hunter-gatherer infants spend only half as, about half as much time crying as do Western infants, because yes, maybe they may cry more frequently, but then once picked up, they immediately quiet down. Whereas a Western child, once the Western child starts crying, the child may be left for 10, 30 minutes crying. So that's response to crying. Now let's talk about physical punishment, another subject of debate. There's much variation in the West among societies and among individuals in whether or not you should spank beat, physically punish a child. There are differences between countries. Uh, today in Germany and in Britain and in Australia, some physical punishment is still not only accepted, but is considered valuable. Whereas in Sweden, um, for a, a parent or an adult to strike a child is a crime today. Today in the United States, there's less physical punishment and in Europe than there was 50 years ago. There are differences within the United States. Fundamentalist Christians tend to be more into physical punishment than are liberals. And within the same family, there is, tends to be alternation depending on what you experience. 
the German Chancellor Bismarck in the late 1800s commented that within a family there tends to be an alternation between the spanked generation and an unspanked generation because those of, those of you those of, um, who were spanked swear, my God, uh, that was horrible and I'm never going to do that to my child. Whereas those of you who were not spanked but instead your parents manipulated you in non-spanking ways for, my God, that manipulation was terrible, better a quick, healthy slap than that manipulation. And so there tends to be alternation within a family between the spank generation and the non-spank generation. Among hunter-gatherer parents, most of them do little or no physical punishment of their children. Among pygmies, for a parent to slap a child is grounds for divorce. Hunter-gatherer children are permitted to have temper tantrums and they're permitted to run around and hit their parents as hard as they can without being hit back. A story that illustrates this is a, a linguist friend of mine who was a missionary linguist, a man called Daniel Everett, um, was working with the Paraha Indians in Brazil. And Daniel had had a fundamentalist Christian upbringing according to which it's appropriate and in fact necessary and desirable to spank your children. So one day his daughter, he was out there with a the, with the Paraha and his daughter Shannon did something or other that he considered required a spanking. But there were Paraha Indians around and he knew that the Paraha uh, did not do spanking themselves. So in order to make this, get this out of sight, he told Shannon, Shannon, you, I'm not going to spank you here. You go down to the end of the airstrip and you cut a stick for me to spank you with and I'll meet you there, down there in five minutes to spank you. So Shannon came out of the house and there were a batch of Paraha Indians around. And the Paraha Indians asked Shannon, so what are you doing? And Shannon knew what their, their reaction was. And, and Shannon put on a big grin and said, said, I'm going down there so that my daddy can hit me. And the Paraha were utterly horrified and, more, and they started jabbering and more Paraha came in and they were pointing out this, this unbelievable man pretending to be a, a missionary linguist with them, this unbelievable man who was going to do this incredible thing of striking a child. Daniel Everett gave up, he saw that he was defeated and Shannon put on a big grin having, <laughs> having gotten what she wanted. So among hunter-gatherers then there's not physical punishment. There's more physical punishment among farmer children than among hunter-gatherers and on the average there's most physical punishment among herders. That's because hunter-gatherers lack valuable physical possessions that their children could damage. Farmers do tend to have valuable physical possessions that the parents don't want to have the child breaking. And herders have the most valuable possessions of all, namely they have their livestock. Um, herding parents want to make sure that the child is not going to leave the pasture gate open and out go the valuable cattle. So herders do punish physically. Farmers do less of it and hunter-gatherers essentially none at all. Now let's talk about the freedom of children to explore the environment. Hunter-gatherer children enjoy high autonomy, the right to decide things for themselves even when they're infants, the expectation that a child is an autonomous being, yes, different from adults with different physical capabilities, but nevertheless with a responsibility for its own actions. And as a result, New Guinea children, New Guinea infants, are considered to have the right to decide for themselves what they want to do about playing near a fire. That, mention, that results, as I mentioned in the case of, of Inu, that New Guinea infants playing near fires. It's up to them how close to the fire they're going to get and the parents will make sure that the child doesn't actually roll into the fire. But the infant is permitted to touch something hot and pull back and possibly get a little burnt by it. That's the child's decision and the child will learn from it. Among the Paraha, the group that Daniel Everett worked with, um, young, young kids are permitted to swing knives around and by and large they don't do themselves a lot, but every now and then accidents happen. So a 
missionary working with Daniel Everett was interviewing a Paraha mother um, while she was with her two-year-old toddler. And as the, the linguist was interviewing the mother, the toddler was there with a nine-inch knife, and the toddler was waving the knife around and bringing the knife close to various parts that you would not want to see perforated or, in, or impaled or cut off. And the mother was going on with the interview. And then the child dropped the, the two-year-old two dropped the knife. And what really impressed the linguist was that the, uh, the mother picked up the knife. And what did she do? She gave the knife back to the <laughs> two-year-old to continue playing with the knife. In New Guinea, um, I'm accustomed, when I'm going around bird watching in New Guinea, I'm accustomed to seeing children off by themselves, even in a river with crocodiles in their own little canoe, doing fishing. I'm accustomed to seeing children off in the forest. They may be gathering food. I'm accustomed to see children gathering trees. One of the New Guineans that I got to know best spent lots of time in the forest, and he would climb trees, and he got interested in birds. So he had his little bow and arrow, and he would make a blind up in the canopy of the, the forest, and he would watch birds. And as a result, um, he became one of the the most knowledgeable bird watchers that I encountered in New Guinea. He gave me an account of 169 bird species in his ear, for each of which he had native names. And he described them from all his time spending up in the tops of trees. Um, another missionary child, another child of American missionaries, I'm coming back to the United States. Um, one of his complaints about coming back to the United States was that, that out in New Guinea, of course, he spent lots of time climbing trees. And when he moved to the United States, the parents next door were horrified at this kid who was climbing trees. That kid might hurt himself, they would say, and they would complain. Um, so that was something that he did not like about American society, that he that nearby parents felt that he should not have the permission to climb trees. Among traditional societies, there's obviously variation in the freedom of the children to explore the environment related to how dangerous is the environment. The environment is, is relatively safe in Australia, and it's relatively safe nowadays with the end of intertribal warfare in New Guinea so that Aboriginal Australian children and New Guinea children enjoy wide freedom to run around by themselves or in groups of kids in the environment. There's more danger for Kung children, for children of sand hunter-gatherers in Southern Africa, where there are lions and hyenas and black mambas. Um, and yes, the children are allowed to play away from the parents, but there's always some parent or some adult or a grandparent somewhere is in the distance keeping an eye on the kids to make sure that the kids don't run afoul of a lion. The danger for children is greatest in South American rainforest, which has scorpions and army ants and poisonous snakes and jaguars. And so children of Ache Indians in Paraguay are, are not even permitted to walk. They're not even set down and not permitted to walk until the anthropologists re reported the age of 22 months. Um, Childhood experts in the United States are astonished and reluctant to believe that Ache children really are not permitted to walk until age 22 months, but the anthropologists who observe it have spent years and years with the Ache and have had ample opportunity to observe it. Now, let's finally talk about play. Let's think of what we call on the American frontier the one-room schoolhouse. One-room schoolhouses were cu customary on the American frontier because in an area with sparse European settlement, there were few families, and so there were very few children. And if you had a school, um, you might have 20 kids in the school, and the 20 kids would be of all ages. So you had to have a one-room schoolhouse, kids of all ages with a single teacher in the schoolhouse. In effect, Hunter-gatherer societies operate as a one-room schoolhouse. A hunter-gatherer band may be typically of 30 people. And with 30 people, so half of them adults, there will be only about a dozen children, a ch children of all ages and both sexes. So you're not going to be able to have an age cohort. You're not be able to, you can't have a classroom of four-year-olds there are a total of a dozen children. And so for a hunter-gatherer band, children of all ages and both sexes play together. 
that has several consequences. Because children of all ages are playing together, uh, it means that the younger children have more models of older children to socialize the younger children. The younger kids are not all playing as a group of six-year-olds. They're playing with older kids who may be eight and 10 and 12, so that there are not just the adults, but more older children to serve as models to socialize them. And conversely, um, older children get experience caring for younger children, and hence the older children, by the time they're teenagers, become adequate, teenaged, adequate, comp competent teenage parents. Again, I'll give you a story to illustrate it. Um, I was in a village in New Guinea where the family that was taking care of me um, had a daughter called Darcy who was 12 years old, and Darcy did washing and some cooking for us, so I saw a lot of Darcy. And to, when I went away, so Darcy was 12 years old then, when I came, and D Darcy was, was well fed, a vigorous, healthy person. When I went away and came back two years later, here was Darcy, she's now 14 years old, and she's carrying a baby. And I'm amazed that she's carrying a baby, so, and so first I ask, her father has said she's 14 years old. Is there some mistake? No, her father was the person who kept the village records. He had the, the birth and death book for the village, so he knew for sure that when ba Darcy was born, he knew for sure that she was 14 years old. And then I thought to myself, I'm astonished. How can a 14-year-old be a competent mother, an adequate parent? And then I reflected, Darcy, by the time that she's 14, she's been dealing with younger kids for half a dozen, eight years. Darcy at age 14 was a far more experienced, competent parent than I was when I became a parent at nearly age 50 without having had any significant experience taking care of children. Play in traditional societies, much although not all tra traditional play, imitates adult life. For example, literally the first morning that I was in the New Guinea Highlands, I went out to the New Guinea Highlands, I was taken out to a village, and late afternoon went to sleep, and the next morning when I woke up, the, boy, the boys in the village were playing. And what were they playing? They were playing war. This was an area where intertribal warfare had ended five years previously, and so the game that the little boys played, were they had their little bows and arrows, and they were in two groups, and they were darting back and forth as they would dodge arrows, and they were shooting the arrows at each other. The arrows were not ones that could do serious damage. They had small bows, and the arrows were made of, of grass, um, grass stalks, so that if a, you got hit by a grass stalk, it would sting you a bit, but it couldn't do serious damage. That was play that imitated the battles that had been going on in that area until relatively recently. It was play imitating adult life. Another form of imitation involves premarital sex, which has been reported in every hunter-gatherer society. And that's because boys and girls playing together in these multi-age playgroups and boy and girl playgroups, they imitate things that their parents do. But since they're sleeping with their parents, the parents are having sex on the same mat where the child is sleeping with the parents. And so what happens if the child is awake when the parents are having sex? The parents just say, turn away and put your head under the covers. But it means that the, the children are accustomed to sex in adults. And when they form their, their multi-age playgroup, and they're experimenting with all sorts of things such as war, they're also experimenting with sex. And so premarital sex is routine among hunter-gatherers. Another feature of hunter-gatherer play is that hunter-gatherer games are usually not competitive and they don't involve keeping score. The anthropologist Jane Goodale, not Jane Goodall, but Jane Goodale, working with the Kowlong people of New Britain, watched a, a, a game of the Kowlong, Kowlong children. So they're a batch of Kowlong children and their mothers, and they were playing a game. And the game was not keeping score and was not to see who can win. Instead, each child was given a banana and what do the mothers teach the children to do with the banana? banana? Not have a competition to see who can get the biggest banana or eat it fast. Is that each child was told to cut the banana in half, and you eat one half, and then you give the other half of a banana to another child. And another child gives 
her half of the banana to you. So you now have half a banana. And you cut that half a banana in half into two quarters. And you eat one quarter, and you give one quarter to another child, and another child gives a quarter to you. Then you take, and you share. Then you take that quarter and cut it into eighths, and you share one eighth with another child, and you cut it into sixteenth, and Jane Goodall watched in fascination until the banana was cut into 32 pieces, at which point finally the piece was so small that you didn't share it, but you popped in the last 30 seconds of a banana. But that was an example of a sharing game. A remaining feature of play in hunter-gatherer societies is that there are absolutely no manufactured, store-bought, so-called educational toys. The toys, all toys, are made by the children themselves, or else the children watch their parents making the toy. For example, a, another US missionary child came back from Kenya, related to me that his Kenya, Kenya, Kenya children like to play with, just as our children play with automobiles, the Kenya children like to play with carts, but they can't buy the carts, they have to make their own carts, and so each child would make his own toy cart of sticks and fiber, complete with wheels and axles. This, that's really pretty impressive to make a cart with wheels and axles. And this friend of mine, this, uh, who came back to the US, he related to me that, that he and his, one of his Kenya friends spent a whole afternoon with this cart that they had made themselves, and they wanted to get this little toy cart towed. So they caught two Goliath beetles, two big beetles, and they spent the whole afternoon trying to harness the Goliath beetles up to the cart and get the Goliath beetles to pull the cart. And he spent hours at it, but he said it, it, they eventually failed because why? They were able to harness the Goliath beetles, but they could not convince the Goliath beetles to pull in tandem. <laughs> when that missionary child came back to the United States as a teenager and encountered American children with their store-bought toys, um, he, was he summed up American children by saying that they lack creativity compared to Kenyan children. And then one remaining feature of play among hunter-gatherers is that there's no separate formal education. Our kids go to school. School education is something separate from the rest of life. There are particular hours and there are, there are professionals who do it. Education is something distinct. But traditional children learn by being with others. They go around with adults whenever that's safe and possible. They, when the adults are talking, there's not a separate adult conversation. The kids are there listening to the adults. And the, ki the kids are learning in multi-aged child playgroups. So that there's not separate education. Instead, learning is part of everyday life. Let's now finally reflect how state societies, what we're used to, differ in their child-rearing practices from traditional societies. And remember, the traditional societies meant everybody on Earth until the first state arose 5,400 years ago. And in modern times, there have still been lots of traditional societies. State societies differ in that the state has its own goals as far as child rearing is concerned. The state wants useful and obedient citizens, soldiers, and workers. And therefore, how the child is raised is not just a decision of the parents, it's a decision of the state. All states, as a result, are convergent in restricting the autonomy of their children and restricting the autonomy of the children's parents because the state wants certain things of their citizens. When you, those of you who came in on a rental car, when you arrived at the airport and you were in the rental car bus to go to the, the off-site rental car depot, there's a recording that you hear on a rental car bus. And the standard recording says that any child under the age of five or under 70 pounds has got to have a car seat. That's a state society. The state wants to protect its investment in children. But to hunter-gatherers, it would be unthinkable that some bureaucrat out there is going to tell any parent what to do with their children. Um, it's a matter of the, ch first of all, it's for the child to decide whether it wants a seatbelt. And it's for the parent to decide whether it wishes to, whether they wish to encourage their children to use seatbelts. So that's child rearing in state societies. The result is that there are 
differences between traditional children and Western children. Westerners like me who spent lots of time with traditional societies. Um, be a consi consistently struck by six things about children in hunter-gatherer societies and small farming societies. And these things have not been quantitated, but everybody that I know who's gone out and lived with hunter-gatherers or small farmers mentioned these things about children in traditional society. They're struck by the autonomy of the children that the kids decide for themselves. They're struck by the emotional security of the children, the self-confidence of the kids, their curiosity, their social skills, and the complete absence of adolescent identity crises. Again, I'll give you a story to illustrate this. When, when, once when I was in, in New Guinea, I think my first trip there, um, I had a group of porters, and they were carrying gear for our bird watching expedition. And we arrived at a village, and the previous porters left. So we had to scrape up porters, but most of the adults were away. And so we were having to to turn to children to see whether children wanted to carry gear for us to get paid. And there was a kid who I guess to be about 10 years old named Euro who volunteered to, to carry for us. We were going to go on. His parents weren't in the village at the time, but we were going to go on for, we didn't say how many days. And so Euro, along with a batch of adults in the village, marched off with us without having informed his parents because they weren't in the village and without having asked his parents permission. We thought that we were going to be gone for just two days, but there was a flood, so we got caught by a flooded river. And then after a week, we got to where we wanted, but I wanted some people to work with me. And so I asked Euro, do you want to earn more money and stay with me and work with me? And again, Euro, his parents aren't there, so Euro decides for himself, yes, he'll stay and work for me. And he, he stays a month. What do his parents know? So his parents come back to the village and they discover that their 10-year-old son is gone. He's gone where? He's gone off with some white man. Where did he go? Went, went off with some other people in that direction. When will he be back? We don't know when he'll be back. Well, okay, that, he's a 10-year-old. He's got the right to make his own decisions. And when he was not back within a few days, eventually um, someone else from the group came back and said, oh, you decided to stay with a white man. How long is he? I don't know how long he's going to stay. But Euro was a 10-year-old, and he's autonomous, and it's his own decision. So these six qualities, then, that strike us about hunter-gatherer children, autonomy, security, self-confidence, curiosity, social skills, lack of adolescent identity crises, they haven't been measured. They're just impressions. But if these impressions are real, what do these qualities come from? We speculate that they may be related to the constant security and constant stimulation that hunter-gatherer children enjoy from all these things that I mentioned. Hunter-gatherer children and small farming society children, they're constantly being held as, in as infants. They're co-sleeping with their parents. They don't have to plead for attention from their parents. They can nurse whenever they want, not three times a day when the mother comes home from work. They can nurse for three or four years before weaning. If they cry, there's an instant response. And they can cry not just if they're hurting, but they can cry simply if they want attention. And that's perfectly legitimate. You get a response within 10 seconds. There's no or an absolute minimum of physical punishment. There are lots of social models available through extensive alloparenting. There's far more social stimulation than for our children as a result of the constant contact and the proximity of caregivers. There's the making of your own toys or seeing your parent make your toys instead of having something ready-made handed to you. And there's constant talking. There's no passive entertainment at all. There's no TV. There's no video games. There's no radio. All the entertainment consists of talk, 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 talk. And again, those of us who worked in New Guinea or among the Kung or among the Pygmies, I'm impressed by how much more time they spent talking, how much more social life they have than we do. The scholars who study child rearing in traditional societies speculate, and this is just a speculation, that those things that I just mentioned, the constant talking, the social stimulation, the abundance of social models, the instant response to crime, they speculate that those things are what's responsible for their impressions of child autonomy, security, self-confidence, social skills. But I have to emphasize that the autonomy, et cetera, those are impressions. 
And it's speculation that what results in those impressions, if they are true, are the things such as constant talking, social stimulation, and so on. At the very least, one can say that co-sleeping, having an infant sleep in bed with parents, and having no physical punishment, and those various other things, at minimum, one can say that those things don't cause children to become psychopaths, and maybe they instead cause children to become secure, self-confident, socially skilled, etc. But in conclusion, we need, obviously need tests to see whether these impressions are real and whether the causes of those impressions, the constant talking, et cetera, et cetera, whether those really do result in the phenomena that have impressed us. I promised to stop talking within 45 minutes, and I did it, so we can now, I think we've got five or 10 minutes for your own insights about science.